criminal ever since her debut is Lady Mastermind. She can create hyper realistic telepathic illusions. One time in Xtreme X Men 9, she created an illusion in Heather Cameron's head that Heather was stabbed, and Heather started bleeding through her pores in the real world. Her shirt was soaked with blood like there was a wound, but nothing was actually there. That's creepy. She also convinced Heather's dad that he was drowning and he suffocated in a room full of air. People tend to believe the illusions, even if it comes with major changes in the environment, it doesn't matter, they feel that real. Plus, with everything going on in the Marvel Universe, getting randomly teleported is not that surprising to think. Mastermind also can make illusions exactly your worst nightmare because she can read your mind a little. It's limited telepathy. She can use her limited telepathic powers to camouflage herself and others or make herself and others appear as someone else. In X-Men Volume 2, 193, she does this and makes an X-Men unknowingly eliminate their teammate. Even if you knock her out, the illusions will sometimes stick around. Big brain doing big things. Next up, the Cajun sensation known as Gambit was one of my favorite X-Men characters when I was a kid. Remy LeBeau has the really cool mutant ability of molecular acceleration, allowing him to convert the potential energy of a non-living object through touch and kinetically excite the molecules to the point that they explode. Usually when a mutant has an ability that manipulates molecules, they have a pretty vast array of powers, but for Gambit, he mainly uses his abilities as simple attacks, charging up his cards or his bow staff. But in an alternate universe, there is a future variation of Gambit known as New Sun, who is what Gambit would be if he reached the full potential of his power. He can manipulate kinetic energy down to a molecular level, meaning New Sun can charge objects and living beings without being in contact with them. He can stop objects that are in motion and make still objects begin moving. He can turn into a wave of energy, letting him travel through space and other dimensions, and he was even able to defeat the Dark Phoenix in his own own universe. Now we do see 616 Gambit use a lot of the same abilities as New Sun in a fight between the two in Gambit's 1999 solo series, but we won't likely see him reach the full potential of his powers again anytime soon. In the wise words of Taylor Swift, Karma is a queen. Karma is also a telepath. She can read your thoughts and stuff, but her main ability is psychic possession. Karma overwhelms her victims' consciousness by sending them mental energy surges. It confuses their brain, and in that window, Karma slips into the driver's Seat. She now controls your body like it were her own. She feels everything your body feels. You would enter a sort of like dreamlike state and you wouldn't even remember anything after. Does she use this method for battling? Yes, but she could also really mess up your personal life if she wanted to. She can do this mind control thing with multiple people at once, but she has to switch from person to person. You can't pull an Uno reverse and mind control her. She has a psychic shield that she can throw up. I think what makes Karma extra powerful is that she could still win a fight without her mutant ability. She trained in self-defense with many military specialists. She spent some time in Vietnam and learned about guns and first aid. And then when her sister died, she got her multi-billion dollar company. She has mutant power, firepower, and financial power. She's doing good. John Paul Bobbier is an interesting mutant with a few different abilities. North Star's main ability is super speed. Now not really in the traditional sense of running really fast. Rather, North Star can propel his body at superhuman speed. Speeds, becoming a living projectile, channeling a portion of the kinetic energy of his body's molecules in a single direction. It's even possible for him to reach 99% the speed of light in a vacuum, but if he were to do that on Earth or something, he'd not only damage himself, but could quite possibly break the entire planet. He can also super speed any part of his body, basically giving him superhuman reflexes and an incredibly fast metabolism to heal wounds. What's really cool is that since he is taking atomic motion, from the molecules of his own muscles, they actually become closer and tighter, making him superhumanly durable as well, allowing him to survive moving at the speeds he does without tearing himself apart. He also uses his ability to fly by projecting the kinetic energy downwards, which in turn lifts him upwards. But in case that wasn't enough, North Star also has photokinesis, allowing him to generate a bright light, which according to the wiki, is equivalent to half a million foot candles, which is an extremely weird frame of reference, but he can also release concussive blasts that do some pretty serious damage, so you know, you win some, you lose some. Our next mutant has powerful telepathic abilities again, and a god complex. His name is Game Master, and he has powerful telepathic abilities. So powerful, he actually needed cybernetic implants to help him control his power. What does he do with all this power? Well, 
He helped run a competition for mutants to fight each other to win a prize. Like a lot of power or something like that. Something tells me this guy would enjoy the Hunger Games trilogy and probably take notes while reading. He got to this point because he discovered that if he is able to really focus on a distraction like those games, then his mental load would be easier to carry. His mental load is a hefty one. He can hear the thoughts of every human on the planet, every living being. So maybe even animals, but that's also like 8 billion people. Their thoughts running through your head 24 7. That's a lot, even for the most powerful telepath. He can manipulate many minds at once, claiming to be able to control the whole world, but I think that was ultimately a lie. But with some training, I wouldn't rule it out. This guy is smart, but since he manifested his abilities at an early age and got no help in developing them, he doesn't have the best skill when it comes to using his abilities, which is probably for the best. He's pretty powerful as unskilled as he is, so it's in the X-Men's best interest to keep him at that level, unless he's on the team, of course. He does join the mutant nation of Krakoa in the end. Next up, Phantom X, or Charlie Cluster 7, or Weapon 13, or John Philippe, or whatever you want to call him, was experimented on by Weapons Plus, and was genetically grown and evolved using Sentinel technology. Now thanks to that, he actually has, or had, three different brains for independent parallel processing. He had nanoactive blood, and his primary nervous system is actually a detachable techno organism called Eva. So there's some stuff to break down there. Eva can fly herself and can generate bioelectric charges to be used as weapons, with Phantom X being both telepathically and symbiotically linked to Eva. His multiple different brains allow him to think like a sort of supercomputer similar to Sage, but it also gives him access to two extra personalities, a charmer and a super deadly mutant hunter. He can create extremely powerful illusions and enter a trance-like state where he can rapidly heal, and he has self-supremacy over his own body and mind, which allow him to overcome pretty much anything to complete his missions, including mind control. He has enhanced senses, is a dope fighter, and does not create any kind of smell. And for the longest time, as a kid, I just thought he was like a glorified super soldier. I guess I was wrong. Did I include this next mutant because we share a name, and maybe more rare, the spelling of our name? Maybe, but that doesn't mean she doesn't deserve to be here. Amara, Juliana, Olivian's Akia, or Magma, is from Nova Roma in Brazil, but eventually ended up at the School for Gifted Youngsters. Her big thing is geokinesis. She can control the Earth's tectonic plates. Sure, is it short range control? Maybe, but the average tectonic plate is 125 kilometers thick, or 77 miles. That's no small feat to move that around and cause an earthquake or a random volcano. In New Mutants 12, she got essayed by a guy and was so mad she just poof, volcano in the middle of the beach. Good for her. The volcano magma lava stuff is called geothermokinesis. She herself has her magma form because the name magma had to come from somewhere. While in this form, there is nothing else hot enough to hurt her and she is physically super bright. She has fire hair too. She can throw lava while in this form and fire too, but the direct contact of magma seems to work better in her fighting style. If you come at her with metal anything, it will probably be a blob when you leave, she'll melt it. The place she grew up in, Nova Roma, was a secret Roman colony, so they did still do some of the training they would have done way back in Rome. That means Magma can fight real good with swords, if all that wasn't enough. If she's hurt, as long as she can touch the ground or something hot, she has regenerative powers. Next up is Sync. Sync has the mutant ability of power mimicry, meaning, kind of like Rogue, Sync can copy the powers of other mutants. But unlike Rogue, Sync has the benefit of not doing any harm to whoever he is borrowing powers from, and he can also do it without physical touch. Recently though, after being resurrected, Sync got a bit of a power boost, and he may even become a new Omega level mutant. In the story, Sync not only uses his normal mutant powers to replicate the abilities of the mutants Sunfire and Cyclops while they are both nearby, but it's also able to tap into Jean Grey's telekinetic abilities as well while she is literally all the way chillin' on Mars. Sync's growth in power post-resurrection was first noticed back in 2021's X-Men number 18, with Sync documenting that he was now able to sync not just with mutants, but other superhumans as well, which is quite the power boost, and I think it just keeps going up and up. In the House of M alternate reality, Sync even got to the point of permanently retaining others' powers, which would be an incredibly significant power boost as well. As a main member of the new X-Men, it's hard to be surprised that he is getting some power boosts. Angel used to fly around and that was it. Well, not it. He and his wings were super
super strong so he could definitely hold his own in a fight. But soon, to put this simply, he got a good side and a bad side. The good side is Angel, the bad side is Archangel. Archangel is a persona that craves death and destruction, so Angel really had to get that in check so he could stay with the X-Men. Archangel did bring a bunch of new powers to the table, like a hypersonic scream. It's what it sounds like, he screams so loud it can cause internal bleeding, which is fine, that's where the blood is supposed to be. To clarify to anyone concerned, that was a joke from a TV show. If you are experiencing internal bleeding, I would go to a hospital or get a blood transfusion from Angel. Yeah, Angel has healing blood now. Turns out, if you get hurt and Angel is nearby, you are good, you're good, you're safe. He can drip some of his blood on your injury and it will heal up quick. For him, he just heals when he gets hurt. Love a good healing factor. The whole Archangel thing gave him techno-organic wings, so like metal wings with a bunch of weapons and combat related uses that eventually go back to feathers. He's good at hand to hand combat and sword fighting and also business. He owns the company Worthington Industries and it's a fortune 100 company. Genius, billionaire, playboy, philanthropist. Jubilee's energy plasmoids might actually be one of the most potent of the X-Men's arsenal. The plasmoids aren't fireworks, even though they look a lot like them. They're actually closer to superheated plasma. She can create a bolt of bright light, but she can also push out enough power to bend steel or like destroy a tree. And with precision, she can even detonate microbursts inside someone's brain. So that's the amount of range we're kind of talking about here. But that ain't all. Emma Frost once speculated if wielded properly, Jubilee could potentially detonate objects on a subatomic level, meaning this unassuming mall rat could like cause explosions of atomic proportions. She's a highly underrated character in the comics and gained a lot of popularity in the 90s thanks to the X-Men TV show. And while she's gone in and out of having powers, she still remains one of the cooler characters in the X-Men's lineup, who is much more powerful than you might assume. Coming in at number 10 today is the Silver Surfer. The Surfer was originally Norrin Rad, an astronomer from the planet Zen Law. When Rad discovered that Galactus, the devourer of worlds, had come to devour Zen Law's life force, Rad struck a deal with the cosmic entity to seek out uninhabited planets that Galactus could consume. Eventually, Galactus became aware of Earth, our little green planet, and he set out to make it his next meal. The Surfer arrived just in time to warn the Fantastic Four of Galactus' arrival, which was his initial reveal into the universe of Marvel Comics in Fantastic Four number 48 to number 50. And that started a great relationship between the Surfer and the superhero family. The Silver Surfer's adventures often center on philosophical conundrums as much as physical challenges, and Stan Lee has used the Surfer as a vessel to express some of the writer's own worldviews. But why is he on the list of ancient heroes? Well, we don't actually have a specific birth year for Norrin Rad, but the Silver Surfer himself has stated that it has been a millennia since he was first transformed by Galactus, and he was a mature member of his species when that happened. And that species is a long-lived one, so it's very safe to say that the Silver Surfer is quite old indeed. Number 9. Mystique To some of us humans, hundreds of years ago feels just as ancient as millions of years ago. Maybe. The Marvel mutant known as Mystique, while you wouldn't think it, has stated that she was not born in the last century and that she's actually over 100 years old. Mystique has a very complex and unrevealed origin. Like Marvel started by introducing her and have only given us brief moments where she has shown up in the timeline prior to that. So this point is more so cobbling together various things she and others has said that point to her being quite freaking old. Mystique has been known to be with her wife, Destiny, by 1895 and she stated that quote, solitude was my natural state for a hundred years, which basically implies that she was born before 1800. In 1921, she met Logan in Kansas City and they all worked together in Scotland shortly before World War II, but in an early appearance in Uncanny X-Men number 170, Mystique dreamt that she was in the year 1783, which is specified as being 170 years before her birth. As the comic was published in 1983, this would make her 30 years old at the time of the story, but that has since been read so as I said, it's a little convoluted. Despite the fact that it is unknown when exactly she was born, it can be assumed that Mystique was born in the month of September, because apparently her birthstone is a sapphire. Twinning. While she might not be as ancient as others on this list, she is still much older than you think and an incredibly hard mutant to bring down. Number 8. Naboo 
Dr. Fate is one of the most powerful magic users in DC Comics, but funnily enough, Dr. Fate is just a name used by the wearers of the Helmet of Fate, which was created by the powerful sorcerer Nabu. Nabu is actually billions of years old as one of the cosmic beings known as the Lords of Order. They came into being at the beginning of the universe and struggled with the Lords of Chaos for supremacy. The Lords of Order actually manifested themselves as the first sentient race in the universe, but it wasn't until 3500 BC in Earth years that one of the Lords of Order descended to Earth and became Nabu the Wise, an advisor to the pharaohs of ancient Egypt. In the New 52 continuity, he is a bit more human and credited as one of the first discoverers of magic, but regardless, after years and years and years serving pharaohs, Nabu did eventually quote, pass on, or it's more so that his physical body could no longer contain him and so his spirit was absorbed into magical items, mainly the helmet of fate, allowing him to live on through it and whoever puts the helmet on their head. Number 7. The Wizard Mamoragan, or the Wizard, or just Shazam's origin story is deeply rooted in ancient mysticism and magic. He was an ancient wizard who once belonged to an order known as the Council of Eternity, sworn to safeguard the realms from supernatural threats. Thousands of years ago, during the days of ancient Egypt, Mamoragan was granted incredible magical powers tied to the six gods of Solomon, Hercules, Atlas, Zeus, Achilles, and Mercury. As the wielder of the magic word Shazam, Mamoragan could channel the combined abilities of the six figures, bestowing those powers upon a worthy champion. However, when his first champion, Teth Adam, aka Black Adam, fell to darkness, Mamoragan sealed the powers away for centuries. In the modern era, Mamoragan's essence endured, choosing the young Billy Batson as his new champion. When Billy utters the word Shazam, he transforms into the superhero Shazam, embodying the collective powers that Mamoragan once held. Mamoragan's origin story is a tapestry of ancient magic, responsibility, and the passing of the torch to a new generation of heroes who carry his legacy in the form of Shazam. He was a hero, but has kind of become something much more important. Number six. Hercules. Hercules is the son of Zeus, sky father and supreme ruler of the gods of Olympus, and Alcmena, a mortal woman who lived over 3,000 years ago. Athena, the goddess of wisdom, arranged for her father Zeus to have a half mortal son to be the world's champion. Zeus seduced the mortal queen Alcmena, pretending to be her husband, King Amphitryon, I think is how you pronounce that, and Alcmena gave birth to the baby Hercules. Now, as an adult demigod in ancient Greece, Hercules achieved worldwide fame as he became the greatest hero of the ancient world, best known for his 12 labors. As the Olympian god of strength as well, Hercules' strength is unlimited, making him one of the strongest and most powerful heroes in the Marvel Universe. As an infant, he was breastfed by his stepmother, Hera, queen of the Olympian gods, which increased his already demigod physiology to a godlike level. Hercules possesses the superhuman physical attributes of an Olympian god, but interestingly, some of his powers are superior to the vast majority of his own race. Most most recently though, he is a member of the Guardians of the Galaxy, but he has also been a part of the Avengers, the God Squad, the Council of Godheads, the Mighty Avengers, the Secret Avengers, the Defenders, the Heroes for Hire, and of course, S.H.I.E.L.D. Number 5. Anthro Created by Howard Post, Anthro is considered the first boy on Earth, existing in prehistoric times. He lived with his family during a period when the world was still in its primal stages. Anthro's curiosity and adaptability drove him to explore the challenges and mysteries of a world populated by both primitive creatures and nascent human tribes. Through his adventures, Anthro unwittingly played a significant role in shaping humanity's development and survival, often making use of his ingenuity and courage to overcome obstacles, while also being a part of some modern age stories thanks to time travel. He's popped up in Crisis on Infinite Earths, Armageddon 2001, Zero Hour, Team 13, and Final Crisis, and he's even been to the Marvel Universe where he interacted with Devil Dinosaur. Anthro's narrative explores the struggle for survival, the emergence of intelligence, and the foundation of human civilization. His story reflects the essence of human curiosity, resilience, and the quest for progress, serving as a symbol of humanity's earliest steps into the unknown. His powers are, well, pretty much non-existent, but he has played a part in some big events and in more than just the background kind of way. Number 4. The Ancient One Born over a thousand years ago, the Ancient One, otherwise known as Yao, was a local to the Tibetan ancient city of Kamar. 
Tosh. Under the guidance of the mystic sorcerer Kalu, Yao delved into the ancient arts of magic and arcane wisdom, eventually surpassing and even facing his mentor. After facing his mentor, granting himself long life, and fighting alongside sorcerer supremes throughout time, he sought out an order of ancient magic users known as the Ancient Ones in order to devote his entire life to their goal of combating evil sorcerers. The youth eventually became even more skilled than his colleagues though, and grew in power so great that he was the first mortal ever of Earth to meet with Eternity, the sentient embodiment of the universe, who presented him with the amulet of Agamotto and charged him to become their Earth's dimensions Sorcerer Supreme. After spending a ton of time trying to sculpt a successor and having multiple possible choices, Yao eventually passed on and left the Sorcerer Supreme mantle to Dr. Stephen Strange. Number 3. I Vampire Vampires in DC Comics are practically indestructible and can regenerate any damage done by consuming blood. They have superhuman strength, speed, reflexes, stamina, can transform into bats, wolves, rats, and mist, and have enhanced senses and a bit of psychokinesis. But despite that, they do have some major weaknesses that pretty much everyone is aware of, with a big one being the frickin' sun, unless they can find a way to temporarily make themselves immune. But for I Vampire, otherwise known as Andrew Bennett, the former 16th century English nobleman in Queen Elizabeth's court, he has a peculiar ability to eventually automatically revive himself after he is sent to the grave. Even if he becomes a pile of ashes from the sun, he has even survived the end of the universe. I don't know how that's possible. The ability is a bit of a mystery, even to Bennett himself. When he survived the end of the universe, it was at the will of the presence, leaving some to believe that this may be true in all cases, but that's not actually confirmed. Whatever the reason, it has allowed him to survive as a heroic vegetarian vampire all the way until the modern day. Number 2 Dream The Endless, featured in DC's Sandman story, is a group of seven siblings. Death, Destiny, Despair, Desire, Delirium, Destruction, and the focus of our point today, Dream. These siblings represent fundamental aspects and forces of the Vertigo slash DC universe, and they are all immortal, ageless, and nigh omnipotent. The parents of the Endless were revealed to be the embodiment of Time, father of the Endless, and Night, the embodiment of the infinite darkness that existed before the dawn of the universe, and the mother of the Endless. So it's safe to say that these beings are probably pretty ancient. Like, 10 billion years ancient. They came from the beginning of the universe. As for Dream, or Morpheus, he isn't so much a superhero as we are used to, but he is an extremely powerful, reluctant hero. And his journey to that status from emotionless god to a being displaying very human like emotions and characteristics is the fundamental story of the Sandman. Dream dwells in a realm called the Dreaming, from where he controlled the fundamental concept of fantasy and reality in the universe. As the line between the waking world, World and the dreams is quite thin. And in at number one today, it's Hippolyta. This queen's history begins thousands of years ago, around 1300 BC. The Greek pantheon held a meeting convened by the goddesses. They were discussing the creation of a race of humans that would champion their ideals. The male gods, including Zeus and Ares, did not seem interested in this, and Hera did not wish to go against her husband. So it was left to the other primary female Greek goddesses. They decided to travel into the the underworld where they came upon the Well of Souls, where the souls of all the women murdered by men's hatred were gathered together. The goddesses took these souls and went and dropped them into a lake in Greece. The souls mixed with the clay and the stone of the lake bed to form the Amazons, and the first one to emerge from the waters was Hippolyta. The goddesses appointed Hippolyta, or Hippolyta, however you want to pronounce it, to be queen, and they decreed that the Amazons were to spread the message of peace, tolerance, and equality by being super dope warriors. Yes, wonder Woman is also pretty ancient too, but Mama came first, so here we are. Sorry. Number 10, Quasar. Quasar is Wendell Vaughn, a being of pure quantum energy. When armed with his quantum bands, he is even more powerful. The quantum bands allow Quasar to create constructs and shields. They also give him the power to absorb energy and complete quantum jumps, effectively teleporting. Quasar managed to survive in a fight against Annihilus, attempting to teleport away before he was destroyed, but only managing to do so at the last minute with 
with his mind. For a time, he'd become trapped in the negative zone mentally, ceasing to have a physical form, passing on the mantle of Quasar for a time to Philavel and Nova's Richard Ryder after. However, Quasar's defeat during Annihilation would seemingly only make him stronger, as after a time he managed to somehow regain his physical form, returning only to go on a journey to the Cancerverse, acting as a scout for his own universe. Existing as a being of pure quantum energy means that Quasar is a powerful hero to go up against and might make him too powerful for the Marvel Cinematic Universe in the end. Good old Wendell. Number 9. Gladiator Gladiator is one of those heroes whose powers are only limited by his own state of mind. Literally. Gladiator's confidence is directly tied to his power levels, and the more confident that he feels, the more unstoppable he becomes. For a time, Gladiator actually ruled his people as the Magister of the Shi'ar Empire, out in space. But more recently, he decided to step down, believing that a Naramani was needed on the throne and relinquishing his place to Xandra. Gladiator himself is Kalark, a Strontian who went through an enhancement process to make him worthy of the rank of Gladiator. He is immensely powerful, being super super strong, fast, agile, invulnerable, and possessing a healing factor. He is capable of interstellar flight and is an incredibly gifted and experienced fighter. And friends, if you are liking this list and you want more lists like it, if you want that part three, I don't know if we can do one, but I mean, there's a lot of characters in the Marvel Universe, so I'm sure we can. Be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number eight, Black Bolt. Black Bolt is the king of the Inhumans. We probably won't see him anytime soon in the MCU, not just because you'd then have to explain all about the Inhumans and what they're up to, and because he's super OP and can wipe out most opponents with just a whisper, but because we already tried to introduce the world to the Inhumans via their own television series, and it did not go well. Black Bolt, however, still has some pretty cool powers, and the Inhumans are a pretty cool bunch, if we did feel that they might be a good fit. We just might have to tone down Black Bolt's powers somewhat, or maybe also find like another way to have them? I don't know. He was considered powerful enough to take on Thanos, and he even survived a one-on-one -on -one battle against him in the comics. He was able to shatter Thanos' armor during their fight, though his powerful voice did not harm the Mad Titan directly. Rats. He also seemingly killed one of the most powerful Omega-level mutants around, Vulcan, who was on part one of our list. However, this was later retconned to not have actually happened, as we later learned during Hickman's reign over the X-Books that Vulcan actually survived the fight. Apparently. He looked pretty dead. It looked like he was pretty dead, but he survived. How? We don't know. Number seven, Starbrand. Another cosmic hero who right now is in the care, I suppose, of the Avengers is Starbrand. Well, one of the Starbrands. There have been other Starbrands before in Marvel Comics, but this one is unique in the sense that she is just a little baby, or maybe more of a toddler now, actually. Either way, it would be pretty weird to see such a powerful young one fighting as a member of the Avengers, unless we're thinking of going the route of Baby Yoda, I guess, aka Grogu in Star Wars. Still, it seems unlikely. Whether it's little baby Selby or Kevin Connor, it's very unlikely they're going to get either of the star brands out in the MCU. Their invulnerability, super strength, matter manipulation, energy manipulation, cosmic awareness, and healing powers may simply just be too much for the MCU to handle. Sorry, star brand. Star brands. Number six, Hyperion. Hyperion is known for being Marvel's version of a literal Superman. Sure, we have Sentry and Captain America who are comparable in terms of their powers and their role, but Hyperion in the newest Heroes Reborn series seemed to be really, really exuding those Superman vibes. Here, Hyperion was the leader of the Squadron Supreme of America, an elite team of heroes who were also all kind of messed up. Hyperion himself seemingly had a god complex that perhaps was well earned considering what he was capable of. When all their enemies escaped their negative zone prison, Mark Milton as Hyperion was the first to respond, and he handedly took down pretty much everyone who got out, including Galactus, a version of Gladiator, a version of the Beyonder, a giant man version of Ultron slash evil Hank Pym, and a version of the Annihilation Wave. Granted, this Hyperion technically is an alt version, but either way you slice it, either way you dice it, any version of the hero is really too powerful and likely too similar to DC's soups to make an appearance in the MCU. Number five, magic. Teleporters always rank high on my list of powerful heroes because I think teleportation is super OP, and magic is definitely no exception there, although she is exceptional. So exceptional, in fact, if we didn't 
get to see her in the MCU, I personally would not be surprised. True, we did get to see magic appear in the New Mutants film, but that itself was outside of MCU continuity and canon, so doesn't count. Which is really unfortunate, as Anya Taylor-Joy was perfect in that role, and we likely won't get to see her take up the mantle again, which kind of bums me out. Magic is a member of the New Mutants who is also known for being not just a powerful teleporter, but magic wielder as the ruler of Limbo. This is where magic teleports through to get where she is going. While in Limbo, she also becomes god level due to her attachment and relationship with the dimension. Magic also has a dark side known as Dark Child. While in her Dark Child persona, she becomes virtually unstoppable and generally a lot more evil. Number 4. Nova It feels pretty unlikely that we'll ever get to see any version of Nova show up in the Marvel Cinematic Universe at this point. Why? Well, because the Nova Corps were seemingly wiped out by Thanos when he went after them for the Power Stone. It's believed that all of Xandar was decimated in his attack, which likely means that the Nova Corps, who were there, were some of the first people to go. Unless there was somehow, I guess, a lone survivor who could become Nova in the future, it seems very unlikely we'll see any kind of character attached to Xandar or the core. This could be just what Marvel Studios was hoping to eliminate the chances of, though, with this plot point, as all versions of Nova are considered to be pretty epically powerful. Whether we're talking about Sam Alexander, Rich Ryder, or Eve Bakian. Just all the Novas. They're just all pretty crazy. Number three, Blue Marvel. So, as much as I really want Adam Brashear to come to the MCU, there is also a concern many have around the fact that this hero might just be too powerful to appear in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. At least as he is in the comics. Maybe if we toned him down? Granted, we have Captain Marvel, and now we have Monica Rambo, who's pretty crazy powerful. So I'm really hoping I'm wrong about this one. But still, there is Captain Marvel and Monica Rambeau, and then there is Blue Marvel, who's kind of operating on a whole other level, due to the fact that his powers are derived from antimatter, and the fact that he is basically an antimatter generator slash reactor. And if you don't know, antimatter is like crazy powerful and crazy efficient um, in the Marvel Universe. I don't know about antimatter in real life. I don't even know if there is antimatter in real life. I don't know about that science. Number two, Eternity. Eternity is not a conventional hero and more a cosmic entity, but like the Living Tribunal, they are also generally seen as a force of good. So, hence why I'm counting them on the list. Eternity is actually just below the Living Tribunal in terms of rank in the universe and is the personification of time. They exist alongside their sister, Infinity. Eternity is capable of manipulating time and space on a lucrative scale. They are immortal and are considered an integral part of the universe, existing alongside other major cons concepts, which are also represented by powerful entities. Number 1. One Above All The One Above All isn't your typical hero, but they are a very powerful force of good in the MCU, like Eternity. One Above All is seen as the creator of the multiverse and all beings within it. They are basically the god of the multiverse, the ultimate creator. We talked about the Living Tribunal on part 1 of this list who is seen as the ultimate bringer of justice, the ultimate judge throughout the Marvel multiverse, and the One Above All is actually believed to be the entity that the Living Tribunal works for. One above all is believed to be all powerful and omnipotent, getting involved in the matters of its creations only when its interference is truly truly needed. They were the one who made Adam Warlock take up the mantle as their new Living Tribunal as payment for restoring all of reality after it was destroyed. Which seems like a fair trade. They're like, hey Adam Warlock do this job and have lots of power and I will return reality. Just come work for me, you know? <laughs> I need a new living tribunal. You know how it is when the living tribunal dies. Actually, I don't know how that is. Sounds like a very rare problem. Number 10, Powerhouse. It feels weird to have Franklin Richards at the bottom of a too powerful or most powerful style list. However, while Powerhouse was once one of the most powerful heroes in all of the Marvel Universe, even becoming so when he was just a little baby, so much so that his dad, Reed, actually had to shut off his son's powers, he has been having a rough go in the comics over the last little while. Franklin was believed to be a mutant with the power to warp reality giving him access to a ton of extra power. But unfortunately, his powers have been on the fritz recently, and now he seems to have completely lost them. It's even believed that he was never truly a mutant, but instead subconsciously used his powers to alter his DNA, meaning that he can't even go to Krakoa currently anymore. I wouldn't expect us to see any kind of reality warping version of Franklin in the Fantastic Four film if we get a version of him there at all. Although honestly, depowering him in the comics may be part of a plot to have him come into the film. 
more comic book accurate to who he is currently in the comics. Meaning production and writers wouldn't actually have to worry about his crazy powers and writing those in, which would likely get in the way of any massive threat as while powered, he could normally stop, well, just about any of them like that. No infinity gauntlet snaps, but just normal power reality warping snaps. <laughs> Number 9. Rachel Summers Rachel is one, really powerful, and two, just pretty unusual. Which makes her a hard sell for the Marvel Cinematic Universe on both those fronts. Although the mutants will be coming soon, so there is a small chance, I suppose, that Rachel could show up at some point. Rachel isn't from the main continuity of Earth 616, but is the daughter of Jean Grey and Scott Summers, aka Cyclops, of her own reality, Earth 811. Rachel is considered to be Omega level, so in theory, the highest level there is of mutant, although there are a few who threaten to surpass that level in the comics. She is an insanely powerful telepath, telekinetic, and can also manipulate time, even being capable of traveling through it. Rachel can also shield herself against time manipulation from outside forces, protecting her against alterations to the timeline. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more lists about all the cool things happening in the MCU, or not happening in this case, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8. Squirrel Girl It feels weird putting Squirrel Girl on this list, but she is weirdly one of the most OP heroes we have in the comics. Squirrel Girl is a hero who can pretty much defeat any threat she goes up against without usually even needing to fight. She handily defeated Doctor Doom using her influence over squirrels and defeated Galactus just by having a conversation with him and being overall fearless. Squirrel Girl usually befriends many other heroes and villains alike whom she meets which tends to be her secret weapon when it comes to winning any fight. Doreen Green is also a kind of odd hero so we likely won't be seeing her in the MCU anytime soon for that reason as well. But honestly, I kind of wish that we would. She might be odd and weirdly OP, but she's also had a lot of great moments in the comics and it would be really cool to see her cheerful, awkward, and infectiously fun nature come to life on the big screen. Number 7. Vulcan Vulcan is another mutant who is likely considered too powerful and possibly too complicated to show up in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I know we are getting mutants, so likely a lot of these folks could be showing up at some point, but I don't know if Vulcan's gonna be one of them. Vulcan is not only Omega level, but is actually implied to be one of the few that I mentioned earlier who could potentially be past, or at least at times, surpass Omega levels. He is one of the coolest power sets in comics, which is also shared by other super awesome, but perhaps less mainstream mutants such as Bishop. I love Bishop. He's another mutant that I would love to see show up in the MCU with the X-Men crew at some point. I mean, we did get Cable and Deadpool, so I feel like that could be possible. Vulcan has no limit to the type of energy he can absorb and utilize, even being able to harness magical or cosmic energy from the likes of Adam Warlock, although I do believe he does have limits when it comes to how much energy he can harness or utilize. Vulcan also can use his powers to reduce or even turn off the powers of those that he faces. Vulcan is Gabriel Summers, the mysterious younger brother of both Scott and Alex Summers. The one that for years we were like, does he exist? Why did Mr. Sinister randomly mention him and then we just never saw him? And then he finally showed up in the 2000s. He was like, hey, just been here all along doing other stuff in space, being real messed up. Number 6. Sentry The Sentry would be an interesting character to have in the MCU because he is actually a hero who was retconned into existence. The Sentry is Robert Reynolds who is revealed to be a drug addict that was looking for a fix when he stumbled upon the Golden Sentry Serum and accidentally basically became a hero. Unfortunately, due to the fact that Bob was mentally unstable, he ended up not just becoming the world's greatest hero, but also having another persona who was considered the world's greatest villain, known as The Void. When it was revealed that the Sentry and The Void were both Bob Reynolds, the heroes banded together to help Sentry make the world forget that he ever existed, which basically allowed The Void to also not exist. In so doing, Bob went back to living a relatively normal life, but when his memories began to resurface years later, he would return. Doing so would also awaken The Void within him, and it would once again be revealed, this time more to all of the heroes, that the two, Hero and Arch Nemesis, were actually 
actually connected and the same person. Number 5 Silver Surfer The Silver Surfer is one of the strongest beings in the Marvel Universe. He is considered to be the most powerful of all Galactus's heralds, and despite usually being associated with that Marvel antagonist, typically acts as a hero, even choosing to stay on Earth for a time after coming to warn them of the arrival of Galactus. Silver Surfer is Norrin Rad, a hero who possesses the power cosmic, which grants him tons of astonishing abilities. The power cosmic is OP. He's also virtually indestructible, being immortal, invulnerable, and having a healing factor, even if you could hurt him. He also now is basically untouchable, being intangible as well. And that might sound like a setback, but he can still merge with other living beings, in essence, bonding with them and using them as a host. So even though he can't physically touch stuff, he kind of still can. The Silver Surfer isn't just powerful alone either, he also possesses the power to bestow portions of his powers on others, which would have been really handy when everyone was dealing with Thanos, his army, and the Black Order in Avengers Infinity War. Number 4 Hope Summers Hope Summers is the adopted daughter of both Cable and later Cable's wife in the future, who is actually also named Hope, but not the same Hope. Hope was the mutant Messiah baby, the first new mutant born after the events of M-Day, and actually originally she didn't have a name at all. The baby would be raised by both Cable and Hope, only being given the name Hope Summers after her adoptive mother died, so she was basically named after her. Hope's mutant powers allow her to mimic the powers of others, managing to use those powers at their peak potential, even if she's completely inexperienced with them or unaware even of what they are or how they work at all. Hope's use of any powers she adopts is intuitive, she doesn't need to make physical contact to mimic them, she just needs to be in the area of the mutant who possesses them as well. Her own powers cannot be absorbed, and she has a calming effect on others mutant abilities, basically helping to perfect and stabilize them. So Hope's also just a powerful character to have around if you're a mutant who's like, I don't really know what I'm doing. This makes her an integral part of the Five, a group of mutants responsible for resurrecting fallen or lost mutants of Krakoa. Despite the fact that Hope's powers are believed to be restricted to the adoption of other mutant abilities, she and Scarlet Witch together rid the world of the Phoenix Force during Avengers vs X-Men. Now this is kinda weird because Scarlet Witch no longer is a mutant in the current comic book continuity, which could imply that Hope's powers mimicry is actually not therefore mutant exclusive. Unless something else was going on there and it was more like Scarlet Witch influencing Hope, I don't know, but I'm just saying if Hope was influencing any of that, that doesn't make sense if Scarlet Witch is no longer a mutant. Unless that's all a lie, and that's gonna be re-retconned away. Please, please do that, please do that. Number 3 Phoenix One hero that it seems is really, really, really hard to get right when it comes to the films is Jean Grey. Jean by herself is already likely too powerful to show up, although I will say I think you can make that work if you just, I don't know, put more of a lockdown on her power set. However, if we are talking Jean Unleashed, Jean and her full potential, that's just not going to work. And if we're talking about bringing Phoenix into the mix and bonding Phoenix with Jean, that's also going to be a huge problem. Anytime you have a character like that who has the power to warp or manipulate reality, you're going to have a challenging time writing any kind of threat for them to face. As with what usually happens with Jean Grey, you can have the Dark Phoenix come in and play villain, you can have Jean struggle to control her own powers and even struggle to maybe hold on to her sanity in the face of her powers, but a hero who happens to have control and be able to basically fix the world as she sees fit? That's a problem. It's like any villain you face, you're just going to be like, well, you're gone. You never existed. Done. Easy. What's next? Number 2 Living Tribunal The Living Tribunal isn't entirely a hero, or not a hero in the traditional sense, but is usually considered to be a force of good because of what they represent. The Living Tribunal brings a force of balance and justice to the cosmos and across the multiverse. While there are many different alternate versions of characters from each universe, there's actually only one Living Tribunal, which watches over all of the realities, getting involved when they believe an injustice has been committed and the scales need to be balanced. Of course, only if the injustice is super great. They're not just like, hey, I saw you littered, that's not cool, let's go to court. So not every injustice. The Living Tribunal was the one to call to trial a case of 1610, or the ultimate reality, versus the current main continuity reality of Earth 616. This case was about determining which reality should ultimately be considered the true main reality, as the Living Tribunal considered that the Earth of 1610 could actually be a good replacement for Earth 616. Fortunately, She-Hulk was able to convince them otherwise. 
because She-Hulk is an amazing lawyer. Number one, the brothers. The brothers are a duo of cosmic entities who exist even outside of their respective multiverses, as each one represents either the DC or the Marvel multiverse. These two characters initially showed up in a crossover comic called DC vs Marvel, which already made it unlikely that we'll see them anytime soon in the MCU, because we would then need a crossover movie, which I don't think is going to happen yet. Maybe at some point. For a time, the brothers considered fighting one another in an attempt to acquire complete uniqueness, but instead decided, as they were pretty evenly matched, that they should appoint representatives from their universes to act as their champions. It's believed that the brothers are actually more powerful than the sum of their parts, meaning that even the living tribunal could be considered below them in terms of power levels and importance. While the brothers also have a male centric name, the brothers, it should be noted that they're actually genderless, so. They're also kind of the sisters. They're kind of, they're just whatever. They're just called the brothers. They look like giant mechs, so you know. No bits. <laughs> I don't think. And at number 10 is Red Hood. Now look, technically, things have changed for Red Hood recently as he has finally agreed to take a less lethal approach to crime fighting, which is why he is at the top of this list. But even though he doesn't bring people to the end of the line anymore, he still leaves them on the brink of the afterlife, and it's debatable whether that is actually necessary all of the time. But outside of his recent developments, Red Hood is an incredibly lethal hero, with almost no qualms about taking the lives of the criminals he faces. And that will be a running theme for pretty much all the heroes on this list. Jason Todd began his time as the replacement Robin, but he had nothing new to offer other than being a bit rebellious, so you guys, the fans, got him savagely taken down by the Joker. Good job. It's actually kind of funny though, because when DC brought him back as the Red Hood, everyone absolutely loved him. Now, he's the black sheep of the Bat family, wielding his dual blam blams and constantly going out of his way to subvert the patriarch of that costume family by going far above and beyond the necessary limits. And at number nine is Rocket. Icon is quite possibly one of the strongest Superman like characters in DC Comics, and he is, in my opinion, kind of way cooler. But Icon would have never become Icon if it wasn't for Raquel Irvin, a teenage girl who inspired Augustus Freeman the fourth to use his alien powers to become a hero. And while she had no natural powers of her own, she used an alien created inertia belt to let her manipulate kinetic energy and to stand by his side as his sidekick, dubbing herself Rocket. As the human sidekick to an incredibly powerful alien superhero, Rocket needs to bring all the power she's got just to keep up. But on the side of being a superhero, Raquel is also an amateur writer, a high school student, and a single teen mom, all while living in the poorest crime ridden neighborhood in Dakota, Paris Island. She does all that and has the power to punch dudes through brick walls. There was even a time that she absorbed the kinetic energy of falling out of a plane and used it to completely destroy a whole building in one punch. So now you know I wasn't joking about her giving it her all. Number 8, Rocket Raccoon. From one rocket to another rocket. Only this rocket wields absolutely massive out of this world weapons and is a four foot tall raccoon with exceptional tactical skill and a pretty creative potty mouth. Rocket the raccoon has had a fairly messed up past which I think is a common thread for heroes who don't really hold back. It gives them a bit of a cynical view of the world most likely. Now Rocket comes from half world in the Keystone Quadrant star system. Here a group of aliens built a massive insane asylum which then had its funding cut so they abandoned the project but left the patients with robot stewards to watch over them. Now these robot stewards became sentient thanks to a supernova and so they genetically engineered the animal companions of these patients to do the job that they were supposed to do, providing them with tons of equipment, weapons, and toy parts. Now this is where Rocket comes from. Eventually he went off half world and became an incredibly adept bounty hunter with Groot and eventually joined the Guardians of the Galaxy when Peter Quill put them together to face the Phalanx invasion. Being a little tiny raccoon means Rocket has got to compensate, and he does that by being exceedingly good at his job and going completely all out on his enemies. In at number 7, Ghostmaker. In the same vein as Red Hood, Minoka Khan or Ghostmaker is another Batman adjacent hero with absolutely zero issue with using his katanas, or pretty much anything he can find, to usher criminals into the underworld. The difference here is that Ghostmaker is practically on the same 
same level of proficiency as Batman himself. Bruce Wayne and Khan have trained under many of the same mentors and at the same time, being rivals since they were in their teens. Where Batman sees crime fighting as a duty that he needs to perform, Ghostmaker sees it as an art. And this difference has caused them to go head to head on multiple occasions and eventually led them to vowing to just stay the heck out of each other's way. As Ghostmaker sees this as an art, he never holds back because he's constantly trying to one up both himself and everyone else. And I mean, honestly, he's really freaking good at it. He has even gone into Gotham to clean up the messes that Batman couldn't handle, which is a controversial statement to make, but we can talk about that in the comments down below. Also, Ghostmaker is kind of hilarious. If you want to know what I mean, go read the comics where he is put in charge of Batman Incorporated. He's ruthless. And at number six is Hawkeye. Hawkeye makes this list for a very good reason. He fights alongside the Avengers, the world's mightiest heroes, and as Jeremy Renner made note of in Avengers Age of Ultron, he is a guy with a bow and an arrow. Hawkeye needs to constantly perform at the peak of his game and keep himself in peak physical condition just to keep up with his allies. And all the heroes want him on their side because they know he does actually deliver on that. But that's alongside the fact that he is constantly dealing with angry exes. Also, Hawkeye was originally and occasionally an assassin. Not holding back is part of his job description, which is why he was tasked by Bruce Banner with completely assassinating the guy while he was the Hulk by flinging an arrow into his eyeball. Sure, he felt incredibly guilty for this, but Hawkeye, an incredibly capable human, was the one who actually took the life of the Hulk. You can't do that and be holding back. And at number five is Moon Knight. Before Mark Spector ever became Moon Knight, he was already not entirely a great person. He was shady for sure, as he was part of the CIA, but also put himself in illegal fights and weapon smuggling schemes, and he was even put on trial for taking out the president of a South American country. He worked as a mercenary, and it was one of the few heroic acts that he did, protecting an archaeologist's daughter, that got him mortally wounded and then revived by the ancient Egyptian god Khonshu in exchange for his servitude. Now, as the fist of Khonshu, Mark would beat down criminals in the middle of the night while also living three other lives with separate personalities. Even though Mark is an Avenger, he consistently takes on his hero work by himself and constantly goes all out on the criminals he finds. Now, due to his split personalities, it's a little difficult for anyone, even himself, to say what he's actually capable of. Where one personality would never do something, another would do absolutely anything. And then there's also the influence of Khonshu that has made Mark abandon people to go and fight whatever battle Khonshu needs him for. Like when Moon Knight needed to fight the Hell Lord Mephisto when he wanted to take over the world. This street level hero took on a Hell Lord. You see what I'm saying here? But more than that, Moon Knight has been able to actually beat all the Avengers and has even been infused with the Phoenix Force. There's a reason that he's one of my favorite superheroes. Number four, Midnighter. For Midnighter, the thing that makes me say he doesn't hold back is his use of his survival implants. These implants let Midnighter completely and flawlessly regenerate from any injury and give him a super enhanced immune system, which has allowed the guy to fight with a broken neck and other broken bones, actual holes in his chest, and while being set completely on fire. Not to mention he's fought after contracting pretty damaging viruses, including AIDS. He can also do this because one of his other implants allows him to turn his pain receptors completely off, allowing him to fight when the pain of his injuries would stop a normal person. It's also meant that he's been able to be completely awake and alert while he was undergoing major surgery. And that's pretty intense. The last of his implants grants him environmental adaptation, which allows him to survive self-sufficiently and without sustenance for indefinite periods of time in places like the vacuum of space. Now take all that and grant it to a guy who has absolutely no issue turning criminals into a bloody pulp, and you've got a recipe for someone who never holds back. In at number three is Superior Spider-Man. Now while it is totally true that Spider-Man himself is known to hold back his power and pull his punches, because you know, Know, greater power, yada yada, great responsibility, that thing. This was not the case when his body was taken over by one of his greatest villains, Dr. Octopus. When Doc took over the body of Peter Parker, he unsurprisingly was not only unaware of the amount of strength Peter actually had, but he was also unsurprisingly morally ambiguous with his use of that power. What do I mean by that? Well, the Superior Spider-Man is pretty well remembered for a little thing that happened when he fought against Scorpion and completely punched the villain's jaw clean off of his face, ending his life 
instantly. There was also the time he went up against Jester and Screwball, two unpowered villains who commit crimes just for the thrill of it. For these two villains, Spider Ock or Spock here used his fist to turn them into unconscious bloody messes. Spock also led an army of henchmen against Kingpin's base of operations and completely leveled it to the ground, completely destroyed the robot body of the Spider Slayer and then mocks him and he also completely knocked out Wolverine in just two hits for touching him. Hilarious. And at number two is Wolverine. If Andrew was here right now, he could probably go on a rant about how Wolverine notoriously consistently chooses the path of most resistance simply to show how tough he is. And yeah, the guy has an adamantium skeleton, one of the strongest healing factors in comic books and his powers can't exactly get out of control so he has almost no reason to hold back at all. He is well known for being one of the wildest, most ferocious fighters in the Marvel landscape. No one wants to face this guy as almost completely guaranteed to end in their loss if not their certain demise. In the Age of Ultron story for example, his very first solution to solve the problem of Ultron was to just go back in time and end Hank Pym's life before he could create the insane robot, which actually would result in a much worse timeline. Or there's Old Man Logan, when the villains coordinated an attack against the heroes and Wolverine thought he completely decimated a large group of villains when he actually took out every single one of the X-Men. The villains took advantage of the fact that Wolverine doesn't hold back to make him destroy his own teammates. It's a well known fact that James Howlett very, very rarely holds back. And in at number one is the Punisher. I don't even really need to explain this one. Punisher is like the black sheep among all the heroes and even the anti heroes. He very much toes the line of being a complete villain. Sure, his targets are almost always criminals and villains, but sometimes they haven't been at all. Frank Castle took the life of Captain America as an example. He's famously the Marvel Universe and he did that while having the same handicap that Hawkeye possesses. The fact that he's just a guy. A guy with an absolutely insane arsenal that he is not even slightly afraid to use. And if he ain't using his weapons then he will use whatever else he has including his own fists. There was even a time that Frank Castle in the 616 continuity used a steamroller to completely crush and flatten Wolverine in an incredibly overly aggressive comic. What am I saying? Almost every comic with Frank Castle in it is overly aggressive. During Civil War, Frank instantly ended the lives of two villains who were on his side as soon as he saw them. He doesn't hold back ever. At number 10, we have Ancient Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider on a freaking mammoth? Are you kidding me? Back when Earth was an untamed land inhabited by tribes of cavemen, the young boy who would become the first Ghost Rider was brilliant among his pack, but he kept this to himself, fearing isolation. One day, a strange man confronts the tribe, swiftly becoming the leader of their pack through violent means and eventually revealing himself to be a Wendigo before devouring the entire tribe, save for the young boy. Before the Wendigo leaves, he names the boy Ghost and challenges the boy to find him. With everyone he'd ever known gone, Ghost ventures beyond his cave, deciding that if the stranger could survive out there in the world, so could he. Ghost then embarks on a quest to survive and find his newfound adversary. Alone in a new turbulent environment, Ghost nearly succumbs to exhaustion, but at that moment he's approached by a talking serpent who bestows upon Ghost the spirit of vengeance as a means of achieving his goal, transforming him to the very first Ghost Rider. Fast forward five years and the stage is set for a showdown. Ghost on the back of a flaming mammoth confronts the Wendigo, engaging in a battle that ends with the Wendigo pushing Ghost atop the mammoth off a cliff, a fall that only the rider would survive. Alone once more, the Ghost was approached by Odin and Lady Phoenix who would ask him to join the prehistoric Avengers. By the way, if Ghost Rider on a mammoth isn't cool enough for you, then try the Ghost Rider of the Hyborian Age about 990,000 years later, when the Ghost Rider of that era rode a giant spider. The Spider Rider would go on to confront Conan the Barbarian, and while we don't know how that showdown ends, you can definitely bet it would be a battle of the ages. Well, the Borean Age specifically. And speaking of which... Number 9, Conan the Barbarian. Conan was born on a carnage-strewn battlefield in the hills of the westernmost region of Chimeria, all the way back in the Hyborian Age, aka around 13 to 10,000 BC. The fact that Conan was born on a battlefield was considered to be an omen that Conan would grow up to be a great warrior one day. And Conan was one of the most accomplished 
accomplished swordsman of the Hyborian Age. He has unusually high strength, agility, and speed for a human. He has lifted immense objects or enemies, even using his bare hands to bring down a raging bull when he was still relatively young. It's said that he has the strength equivalent of 10 to 20 men. More often than not though, Conan relies upon his lightning fast reflexes in combat situations and they've very rarely failed him. On top of that, he has a massive level of durability and through years of dealing with sorcerers, magicians, and witches, he has even developed a moderate level of resistance to magic and mind control spells. Conan is a master warrior. He has a hardy survival instinct, is a master of stealth, and is multilingual. While primarily known as a wandering sellsword, Conan progressively became a master tactician, leading entire armies into battle, and eventually, Conan even became king of Aquilonia, wherever that is. And also, eventually, a hero interacting with the heroes of the modern day. If you're enjoying the video so far, you can support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. Moving on to number eight, we have Odin Borson. Wait, did any of you guys know that the Allfather's last name is Borson? Just me? Okay. Odin, born from the union of Bor, the son of Buri, and Besla, a giantess, emerged alongside his brothers Kul, Vili, and Vs. I definitely butchered that, I'm so sorry. Together, these divine siblings embarked on a cosmic odyssey that would reshape reality itself. They dared to challenge Ymir the Frost Giant, forging the very fabric of the cosmos and existence itself from Ymir's remains. Asgard, the celestial realm, blossomed from the remnants of Ymir, becoming the abode of gods in the heart of their dominion. Yet Odin's exploits were not limited to creation alone. One day, a sentient and all-powerful storm known as the God Tempest threatened the sanctity of Asgard. Odin, as mighty as the storm, Storm was, stood resolute against its fury, and with a display of power that echoed through the cosmos, Odin quelled the Tempest, imprisoning its essence within a fragment of Uru, which would one day become the legendary Mjolnir, a symbol of power and worthiness. Sometime after forging Mjolnir, but long before the birth of Thor, Odin descended upon Midgard, then known as Aesheim, where he bestowed upon the world the gift of humanity. However, even the gods' benevolence can be tempered with enigmatic purpose. Bor, his father, was not entirely pleased with Odin's creation, casting upon humanity the mantle of suffering. As eons swept by, Odin's saga intertwined with the Stone Age. See, Mjolnir proved difficult to wield, leading Odin to forge an alliance with mystically empowered prehistoric humans. Together they united as the Stone Age Avengers, the guardians of Earth's fragile yet flourishing existence. Number 7, The Immortal. Due to an accident that happened approximately 3,000 years ago, the man who became Invincible's Immortal was exposed to an unknown anomaly that gave him superhuman abilities that put him almost on par with Vilchermite making him one of three known beings in the universe that can make that claim. But outside of his incredible strength, speed, durability, stamina, and flight powers, the immortal is, you guessed it, immortal. Able to regenerate at an insanely fast rate, regrowing limbs and organs, not needing food, water, or oxygen to survive, and being immune to all poisons, toxins, venoms, viruses, bacterias, parasites, pathogens, and allergens. However, funnily enough, there is a way to quote, kill him. If the immortal's head is separated from his torso, it needs to be manually reattached for his healing factor to activate. But despite that, even when they aren't attached, he still remains perfectly preserved until the reattachment happens. He's been around for so long that he has been a knight, possibly under King Arthur as Lancelot, an explorer under or possibly as Christopher Columbus in the Spanish Armada. He fought in the American Revolution, became president of the United States by taking the alias of this guy you may know called Abraham Lincoln, and he fought as a soldier in the First World War. In the 1930s is when he officially became a superhero and more recently became a member of the Guardians of the Globe. At number six is Phoenix. We begin with an abandoned infant named Firehair left to her own devices at a place aptly named the Burnt Place. It wasn't a cozy nursery, mind you, but a clearing where xenophobic tribes tried to sacrifice anyone who manifested appearances which strayed from their norm. In this case, the child's red hair. The abandoned infant found herself being raised by an unlikely family, a pack of wolves. Wolves! The original guardians of the forest. Perhaps a canine paw father is what every superhero needs. One fateful day's fire hair solitude was interrupted by a floating man who conversed through thoughts. No need for that pesky small talk. This floating mentor, which Firehair fondly dubbed as the High Walker, introduced her to a congregation of adopted mutants called the Tribe Without Fear, offering refuge and training. Fast forward and Firehair's psychic abilities awaken just in time to sound the alarm about an impending attack from the xenophobes from earlier. As the High Walker faced off against the invading tribe, 
describes men, Firehair's psyche is overwhelmed by the storm of human emotion. Sadly, the High Walker meets his end while trying to calm her. Firehair fainted as her fellow pupils gave into rage and fought the attacking tribesmen, resulting in the demise of everyone present save for herself. Firehair blamed herself for her mentor and friend's demise and was overcome with despair, contemplating turning her powers on herself to unalive herself, returning to the burnt place to be eaten by buzzards. As she lay awaiting her demise, the Phoenix Force, an ancient cosmic entity with a penchant for turning planets into cinder who had created the burnt place when it first arrived on Earth, bonds with Firehair having been drawn to her raw and untapped psychic power. Consumed by a vengeful rage, Firehair almost gave in to the bloodlust and became a dark phoenix, but she was pacified thanks to the one who had saved her as an infant, her paw father, if you will. From that day forward, she would take a page out of the wolf playbook and decide to protect the weak rather than lay waste to the universe. Realizing the threat that beings such as herself pose to the integrity of Earth, she began assembling a team of supernatural and mystically augmented heroes to protect the nation's humanity from both outside threats and themselves, and thus founding the Avengers of the Stone Age. Number 5, Exodus. Grand Duke Benny du Perry was a 12th century nobleman from medieval France in Marvel Comics. Does that count as ancient? I don't know anyone who's around then, so I'm taking it and running with it. What are you going to do about it? Nothing, because I'm just an image on your screen. As an adult, Benet was a crusader for the Knights Templar sent to Jerusalem during the Crusades, and he even became best friends with Eobar Garrington, aka the Black Knight of that era. The two had set out on a quest to find the Tower of Power, which is a stupid name. When his abilities manifested after an encounter with the Phoenix Force, which were then improved further thanks to the mutant apocalypse. But thanks to Big Blue, Exodus was trapped in a tomb until the modern day when he was awoken by Magneto and joined his cause. Exodus is one of the most powerful psionic mutants in existence, with such a pristine use of telekinesis and telepathy that he can even alter electrons and molecules. His power is so strong that Marvel even had to debuff him by making his powers dependent on his or others' level of faith in this mutant. Although, he still regularly kicks some serious butt. At number four is Agamotto. Now, speaking of ancient superheroes, let's uncover a figure whose power and influence might just leave you spellbound. No, he's not your everyday magician pulling rabbits out of hats. We're talking about the cosmic conjurer who would give Doctor Strange a run for his money. Imagine being tutored by a deity, Oshurder no less, the literal elder goddess of Earth. But Agamotto wasn't just a student, he went on to become Earth's very first Sorcerer Supreme. Agamotto would go on to face cosmic threats like the Fallen, and yes, even even Dormammu, which he thwarted alongside the Stone Age Avengers. Now let's talk artifacts. The legend of Agamotto was like an Indiana Jones fever dream as he'd created magical treasures that would make a dragon's horde look like pocket change. First off, we got the eyes, that's right, eyes, plural, of Agamotto. You might remember one of those as the pendant in Doctor Strange's possession that guards the Time Stone. Well, Agamotto made not one, not two, but three of them bad boys. But their intended purpose wasn't meant to guard infinity stones or serve as reading glasses. These peepers could pierce through dimensions, unlocking knowledge that could make Google's search engine blush. Ever heard of the Book of Vishanti? Yup, that was Agamotto's brainchild too. An enchanted book that's like Wikipedia but for spells. Agamotto went from being a mere mortal sorcerer supreme to being a bona fide higher being, a principality. Essentially imagine a being so magically advanced that you become a go-to power source for other sorcerers. Sort of like being the neighborhood electrician for the mystical realm. So there you have it, Agamotto the ancient superhero who wasn't just reading spells from a dusty book, he was writing them into that dusty book, shaping the the very fabric of reality, defending Earth from cosmic threats, and leaving behind a trail of magical breadcrumbs for future sorcerers to follow. Number three, Starbrand Vin. The Starbrand itself is an incredible source of power, proven by other people who have wielded it. The bearer of Earth 723's Starbrand used the power to create music that influenced human behavior to the extent that he has unified the people of his world as a single hive mind. Earth 541 is the home of a Starbrand bearer who has conquered his world and installed himself as the head of a benevolent monarchical dictatorship, but like a good one that actually somehow works despite the lack of freedoms. Thing is, what the Starbrand is capable of is dependent on its wielder's imagination. When it first showed up on Earth, it was millions and millions of years ago coming down with a meteor that wiped out the dinosaurs, but in doing so, it bonded itself to a Tyrannosaurus Rex, which is absolutely awesome. After a few millions of years though, that T-Rex had gone belly up, and the Starbrand found a new bearer in the form of a caveman named Vin. 
It's just VNN. I don't know why it's pronounced like that. Interestingly though, when Vin came upon the star brand and used it to join up with the Avengers 1 million BC, he was actually more analogous to like the Hulk, at least in his looks, and he had a more primitive use of the star brand than other future bearers. But he did live on the moon for a bit and help fight a celestial, so don't get it twisted. He did more than just punch stuff. At number two is the first Black Panther. Meet Mosi, a member of the Black Panther tribe in the legendary land of Wakanda. Now, he wasn't the first of his tribe to munch on the heart-shaped herb, but he was the first to survive the experience as he caught the attention of a powerful entity known as Bast, the Panther Spirit. And let me tell you folks, that wasn't your ordinary herbal experience. We're in ancient Wakanda after all, not modern Canada. With Bast's blessing, Mosi became the very first Black Panther. Talk about leveling up. It was around this time that Earth was dealing with some cosmic turbulence courtesy of a meteor from the Vega system. The rifts it opened up started inviting all sorts of extraterrestrial nasties, like the Brood, to the neighborhood. Not one to let his tribe become an all-you-can-eat buffet for these cosmic creeps, Mosi stepped in as Wakanda's defender-in-chief. And guess who else decided to crash the party? None other than Odin Borison, the Asgardian bigwig himself. Now, Odin wasn't exactly known for tossing around compliments like confetti, but he had to admit he was pretty darn impressed with Mosi's moral moxie. And if that was wasn't enough, get this, Mosi was the first person after Odin to ever lift Mjolnir, proving his worthiness during the first encounter with the rest of the Stone Age Avengers. Mosi and his crew sealed away a colossal celestial, saving the day like it was just another Wednesday. They faced off against cosmic villains like Mephisto and Shumagora, making your average supervillain seem about as threatening as a fluffy kitten. But alas, all good things must come to an end. Mosi met his match in a battle against the children of Lofi and Hive, and his sacrifice marked the end of this ancient Avengers era. The team disbanded with Mosi's demise and also caused the Wakandan people to retreat from the outside world, requesting that the Avengers forget their existence. The nation would then segment into tribes and were not reunited again until the rise of the second Black Panther, Alumo Bashenga. And finally, in at number one today is Mr. Majestic. DC Comics' Mr. Majestic, also known as Magistros, is a character of immense power and capability that often surprises readers with the extent of his abilities. Hailing from an advanced alien race known as the Caribbean, Majestic possesses superhuman strength, speed, and durability that rivals even the mightiest of superheroes. Unlike the lesser cast, however, he is a cherubim of imperial blood, meaning he has a host of cosmic tier physical and mental abilities. Majestic has demonstrated the power to manipulate matter and energy at a molecular level, able to discharge any manner of energy he has on hand however he sees fit, rearranging the subatomic structure of objects, or charging his fists with energy to increase his punching strength. Speaking of strength though, he has rearranged most of the planets in the solar system by just pushing them from his own power and has crushed graphite into diamonds in order to pay for a meal, which those two things are very, very different. On top of all of that though, Majestic is basically Wildstorm's analog for Superman and shares a lot of the same abilities as the Man of Steel. And when interacting with the rest of the DC multiverse, he's considered to be an alternate Earth Superman. Oh, and he makes this list because, being a cherubim, he is about 10,000 years old. Number 10, Martian Manhunter. Well, we did get a glimpse at what Martian Manhunter could have looked and acted like in the DCEU through Zack Snyder's cut of the Justice League, we still haven't had Martian Manhunter properly introduced in the main continuity of the DCEU. Main continuity I guess for the cinematic universe. Unfortunately, while Zack Snyder's cut was his intended vision for the film that he was forced to leave due to a personal tragedy, it's not considered canon to the DCEU. Although this could be retconned later depending on what happens in the Flash movie. Who knows, the Snyderverse could become part of the DC. EU again. Martian Manhunter getting the axe initially in the theatrical release of Justice League could have to do with the fact that he is super cosmic or a little more complicated than most heroes when it comes to his relationship with Earth, or it could have to do with the additional problem of his powers. Also, Martian Manhunter is kind of just complicated in general, but in a good way. Despite the fact that Martian Manhunter, like most other Martians, has a fear of fire, he is still insanely OP when it comes to his powers. Also, Martians might be afraid of fire, but it doesn't actually hurt them as severely as their fears would imply. It's a psychological thing. It's not like, like, yeah, and if you set me on fire, like, pfft. I die, just poof, I'm gone. That's not a thing that happens. They just get burned, like we would. John Johns possesses powers of telepathy, telekinesis, super strength, super speed, durability, shape shifting, invisibility, self duplication, biofusion, and x ray vision, just to name a few. So, yeah. I feel like that could be a big part of why we don't really have him as like a main, a main part of the Justice League yet. 
Number 9. Batmite Although he's somewhat mischievous when it comes to Batmite, he's still generally a force of good. Or at least, he tries to be. Batmite is Batman's number one fan and he idolizes the hero. Like Superman's mischievous imp rival, pal, and sometimes enemy, Mr. Mixie is Pitalik, Batmite is also capable of warping reality, or so it would seem. Later on, his backstory was further complicated when it was suggested that he was merely a hallucination of Batman, a character that represented the rational part of Batman man's mind, and existed only in his imagination. Still not known if Batmite is a true character who exists outside of Batman, or simply a character who exists within Batman's psyche. Either way, he's a tough hero to include in the DCEU. Either because he's just crazy powerful, or because it just makes Batman look really crazy and he's like a tiny little, like almost cartoon bat man guy. <laughs> and friends, before we move on to our next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more lists like this list where we talk about the DCEU, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8. Swamp Thing Swamp Thing may have gotten his own show very briefly as part of the short-lived DC Universe streaming service, which has since been merged with HBO Max and basically no longer exists, but that doesn't mean the hero will be coming to the DCEU anytime soon. Which is a shame too, as that series had amazing reviews, proving just how awesome the depiction of Swamp Thing can be on screen. Swamp Thing was once Alec Holland, a botanist who, after his lab was attacked, was set aflame while doused with his newly invented bio-restorative formula. Alec and his wife Linda had created the formula together. When he ran into the swamp, he merged with it, becoming a new sort of life form, a living swamp thing, if you will, which had also merged with Alec's mind. Swamp Thing is an elemental created in part by the green during its time of need. The swamp thing can connect with and control plant life, has super strength, is immortal, can resurrect, and can change size. There's a lot Swamp Thing can do. If I had a Swamp Thing ad where Swamp Thing was like helping you with plants, that's what it would be. Number 7. Zatanna Zatanna Zatara is one of the greatest magic users that we have in the DC Universe. She might be known for performing magic with phrases spoken backwards, but she's actually so accomplished that she actually doesn't even need to speak to cast all of her spells. Bit of a misnomer, although it is a thing we know her for. She can manipulate time, fly, or give the gift of flight to others, travel to other dimensions, heal, and much, much more. She has knowledge additionally of various different types of magic, including black magic and necromancy. I know we're supposed to be getting a film for Zatanna in the DCEU, like that's a thing that's going to happen, and that it will reportedly have its screenplay written by Emerald Fennel, the director of Promising Young Woman, but we still don't have the film yet, and there have been talks of Zatanna's DCEU film for a while now, so you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm just saying, let's not put the cart before the horse. You know what I mean? Despite how powerful she is though, I would definitely love to see Zatanna in action on the big screen. So I do hope the movie does happen. Not saying I don't want it to, I'm just saying, where is Zatanna? Why isn't she there yet? Is it because she's too powerful? Probably. Number 6. Green Lantern Green Lantern is one of those characters that I'm still amazed we have not yet had in the DCEU. The lanterns were teased in Zack Snyder's The Justice League, nicknamed the Snyder Cut, but we still have yet to really have them properly introduced in the DCEU or even included. It actually feels a bit strange to me that we have Shazam, but we have no Hal Jordan or Jon Stewart or Kyle Rayner or Guy Gardner. Like what? This could be because Green Lantern is such a cosmic hero and so powerful that DC might be afraid any film they put the hero in simply would not work. Also, that's a lot of effects if you're going to space, and they have history with, you know, that hero on the big screen. He was initially played by Ryan Reynolds in a non DCEU related Green Lantern film way back in 2011. It feels like forever ago now, when the MCU was just getting off the ground, and a few years prior to the start of the DCEU itself, with 2013's Man of Steel. Also, oh my goodness, if you go back and watch that movie, like you can see how hard Ryan Reynolds is like trying to be Hal Jordan. And I'm just like, you know what? He, he actually wasn't a bad Hal Jordan. I don't know if that's a controversial opinion. Number 5. Damage Damage is an anti-hero who is considered one of the strongest in the DC Universe. The only catch is he can only transform into the unstoppable monster-like force where he has powers such as super strength, durability, invulnerability, magic resistance, and a healing factor for one hour a day. However, during that one hour, he's pretty much indestructible and unstoppable. He even proved to be too much to handle for Wonder Woman and later gave Superman and the Justice League a run for their money. However, he ultimately did end up being defeated by Deadman in the end who showed up and possessed 
contest him for the remainder of his rampage hour, defeating him. Still, Damage is a pretty crazy powerful anti hero that we likely won't see in the DCEU anytime soon. Likely due in part to how destructive he is, I'm sure. Number 4, Orion. Orion is one of the strongest of the new gods and is also Darkseid and Tigra's son. But despite the fact that he is the son of Darkseid, it doesn't mean that he's inherently one of the biggest bads around. In fact, Orion is actually a hero, the exact opposite of his dad, but not the opposite when it comes to the power that he wields. He is also considered a new god, which means that he's insanely strong, durable, and pretty much inexhaustible in a fight. He is immortal and can easily take hits from Superman without really showing much sign of injury. Orion is also a gifted fighter and leader, and at one point even was able to lead an army in defeating the entire Green Lantern Corps, himself fending off Hal Jordan with one mighty punch. He's like, punch, I'm gonna choke you a bit, and then fight is done. Goodbye. Leaving. I'm rolling out in space. Number 3, Phantom Stranger. The Phantom Stranger is pretty all powerful. Initially, we didn't even fully understand his true identity on New Earth, nor his powers, which weren't super clearly defined initially. What has been defined, however, is that the Phantom Stranger is extremely powerful and thus far seems mainly limited by the fact that he's not really permitted to interfere in the shaping of the universe, meaning he can aid in fights against universal threats but not directly affect the outcome with his powers, more providing guidance than getting directly involved. While back in the New Earth continuity, there were many potential backstories for the Phantom Stranger, on Prime Earth we know that he was once the Judas who was famous for betraying Jesus in the Bible. His punishment following his death was that he would be unable to die, but instead would have to walk the earth for eternity, making him virtually immortal. He became the servant of a voice that spoke to him, and with each task completed, he got closer to his own redemption. Though it has been thousands of years, and he still has not achieved his redemption yet. Number 2, The Spectre. If we're going to talk about the Living Tribunal on our MCU version of this list, you know we gotta talk about The Spectre on our DCEU version. The Spectre is an immensely powerful cosmic entity who is often thought of as a hero, but has definitely had some methods to fighting crime that could be considered morally questionable? Like when he turned a man into wood and then sawed him to pieces? That's a thing that happened. Or when there was a guy that was afraid of fire and he's like, I'm gonna turn you into a candle and like melt you. That was also a thing that happened. I wonder when he turned that guy into wood and then cut him into pieces, if you could count the number of rings inside of him to tell how old he was, like a tree. Because the Spectre can do things like warp reality, that just means that he wouldn't really fit into the DCEU very easily, as we need some massive threats in order to give him any kind of real struggle. He would just be like, I'm gonna turn that person into wood. Now you're a candle. Now you're paper. I'm gonna cut you with scissors. That's all handled. Done. Next. Number 1, Dr. Manhattan. Outside of the Watchmen film we had, which isn't currently considered as part of the DCEU canon, it's unlikely we'll ever see Dr. Manhattan on the big screen again. It's especially hard to have someone like Dr. Manhattan in the films because, well, he's pretty much always naked. Which means we either need to dress him up somehow, put him into an R rated only film, or have a lot of conveniently placed fruit baskets and props around in the foreground of each shot in order to censor him. Dr. Manhattan, though, when it comes to his power levels is one of the people responsible for creating the new 52 continuity. That's just how powerful he is. So to have someone who is capable of rewriting the universe in that way within the DCEU seems like it would be a lot. Unless, I suppose, if you're planning on completely resetting the DCEU continuity. Hmm. At number 10 is Terry McGinnis, aka Batman Beyond. In a future where the iconic Batman Bruce Wayne has hung up his cape, but fear not, because the Project Cadmus director Amanda Waller had foreseen this eventual outcome. She believed that another Batman would be necessary, and thus Project Batman Beyond was born. The plan was as audacious as it was ingenious, combining Batman's DNA from his battles with cutting edge nanotechnology. With the genetic blueprint secured, the only missing piece was a suitable family to raise a successor. Enter the McGinnis household where Warren and Mary turned out to be the perfect genetic match akin to Martha and Thomas Wayne. After a seemingly routine flu shot, they became the proud parents of Terry McGinnis, essentially Bruce Wayne reborn. Amanda even contemplated sending an assassin to ensure history played out, but that idea mercifully fell by the wayside. As Terry grew through his high school years, he found himself tangling in a street gang known as the Jokers with the dead. A chance encounter with an older, weathered Bruce Wayne on the grounds of Wayne Manor led him to a faithful partnership. 
location. Terry's assistance helped Bruce fend off the gang and in turn, Terry discovered the hidden entrance to the Batcave. However, as fate would have it, Warren was taken out by the corrupt CEO Derek Powers who had taken over Wayne Powers. Terry's pursuit of answers led him back to Wayne Manor where he found himself demanding information and eventually taking matters into his own hands. He audaciously stole a Batman suit and confronted Powers, proving himself more than capable. If you're enjoying this video so far, you can support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. It really helps us out, and I appreciate it. At number 9 is Iron Lad. The current big bad of the MCU was a hero at one point in his many, many alternate timelines. And while Kang the Conqueror has had more identities than there are timelines in the multiverse, at one point he was a protector rather than a conqueror. In the year 3016, Nathaniel Richards, also known as Kang the Conqueror, is saved by his future self from a lethal assault by bullies. This pivotal event alters his path towards villainy. See, Nathaniel is bestowed by his future Kang the Conqueror self with new armor and catches a glimpse of his future as Kang the Conqueror. However, instead of embracing this identity, he rebels against his future self and employs the armor to travel back in time to modern day Earth, specifically the 616 reality. Upon arriving, Nathaniel discovers the disseminated Avengers mansion, a result of Scarlet Witch's descent into madness. Despite his efforts to travel further back into time, he encounters the remains of Vision. And so by linking into Vision systems, he assimilates all of his programs, including a fail-safe plan to form a new team of Avengers in case the original team disbands or faces destruction. Adopting the moniker Iron Lad, Nathaniel Richards assembles the Young Avengers, modeling his armor after Iron Man. Later on, Kang returns to the present seeking Iron Lad, intending to send him back to his own time to prevent further disruption in the time stream. Engaging in a battle with the Young Avengers, Kang gains the upper hand until Iron Lad unexpectedly impales him from behind with a sword. Lord. This act leads to further reality disturbances, prompting Iron Lad to realize that he must accept his future as Kang the Conqueror in order to reverse the disruptions in time. Before returning to 3016, his memory is erased and his armor is removed. While the Young Avengers lose a member in Young Kang, his armor fuses with Vision's programming, resulting in a new Vision on the team. At number 8 is Future State Superman. Yeah, you heard me right, Superman is on this list. And I'm sure you don't need me to remind you how powerful Superman is in the present, but in the future state? Mm, not so much. Imagine, if you will, a future in which personal information is exploited to portray the Justice League, leading to their catastrophic breakup. And if that's not bad enough, Superman finds himself impaled with kryptonite, imprisoned in a kryptonite chamber, and subjected to bizarre experiments by a character named Mr. Toad. And if that's not a hefty enough dose of mystery, fast forward a bit more, and Superman's son, John Kent, has taken over the mantle of Metropolis Savior, leaving Kal-El to be trapped by Mongol in a grueling battle arena within Warworld. This leaves Superman completely depowered, forced to fight endlessly for his life until his inevitable demise, only to be resurrected by Mongol, pushing him to fight ceaselessly. But Superman's spirit doesn't waver. He becomes a beacon of hope, rallying other captives to rebel against their tyrannical master. At number 7 is Space Punisher. In an alternate universe, Frank Castle, aka the Punisher, takes revenge to a whole new level. Dubbed the Space Punisher in Earth 12091, his family's demise at the Six Fingered Hand ignites a cosmic vendetta. He later confronts a bizarre lineup of foes Blood Queen, Brood Queen, she's history. Sabretooth and Deadpool, they're gone too, and so is Hulk. The quest leads to Avengers Planet, a clash with Jarvis and Galactus's gear, and an ultimate showdown with the Watchers. In this dimension, Frank Castle's transformation to the Space Punisher is a cosmic saga of retribution. At number 6 is the infamous Doctor Doom. Wait, what? Yeah, you heard me right! This Doom is a superhero. In the year 2099, the twist of fate has our favorite metal clad villain stepping into the limelight as a hero. And mind you, there's not just one, but three versions of Doom to shake it up in the future. Now it might be a tad confusing, so buckle up. First we got our Victor Von Doom that we all know and love, bruised up a bit with no scars and a hint of youthfulness. But there's also an imposter, Eric Cerny, lurking around with a villainous intentions. A brainwashed pretender, if you will. And then as a cherry on top, there's Tiger White. Wild, a cyborg ruler of Liberia, giving that unmistakable Doomish vibe with his metallic exterior and affinity for ruling with an iron fist. Now as the dust settles, the real Doom emerges victorious, and he ends up hatching plans to conquer the good old US of A. But before you label him the next tyrant, hold your judgement because his intentions are surprisingly heroic. On a mission to topple the mega corporations that have hijacked the nation, controlling every nook and cranny of existence. But Doctor Doom is pulling all the stops, using his genius and dare I say newfound heroism to reshape the future. 
At number 5 is Wave Rider, originally known as Matthew Wider, once a human scientist in a world ruled by the oppressive monarch. Monarch had eradicated all of Earth's superheroes and crushed the will of its people. Inspired by a childhood rescue by the enigmatic hero Bennett Dilly, Rider decided to fight back against Monarch's tyrannical reign. Throughout an experimental process, Rider transformed into the Wave Rider, gaining the ability to freely traverse time. As Wave Rider, he possessed the power to merge with individuals and glimpse their most probable future. Following Monarch's eventual defeat, Wave Rider continued to employ his temporal abilities to aid others throughout the time stream. However, his endeavors often brought him into conflict with the Linear Men, a group tasked with preserving the integrity of time. At number 4 is the Cosmic Ghost Rider. Imagine a future where the Avengers couldn't save the day and where Thanos emerges victorious in a truly chilling way. Enter the Cosmic Ghost Rider, a character with a backstory that's as grim as it gets. Cosmic Ghost Rider was once Frank Castle, the Punisher. Yeah, that's right. This list is serving up not one, but two Punishers from space. He became the spirit of vengeance only to return to Earth after it had been reduced to a lifeless wasteland. In a desperate attempt to thwart Thanos, he embraced the role of a Herald of Galactus, wielding the mighty power cosmic, but even this power couldn't undo Thanos' stranglehold on existence. In a shocking twist, Cosmic Ghost Rider switches sides, joining forces with the very tyrant he once fought. At number 3 is Bishop. Bishop is a mutant hailing from an alternate dystopian future. You know, it's not uncommon for mutants to have a thing coming from various bleak futures, but Bishop takes the cake. Lucas Bishop is a mutant from a dystopian future where he has time traveled to join the legendary mutants he'd only heard legends of, the X-Men. In his original future timeline, mutants are confined to camps and the X-Men, along with Professor X, have all bitten the bullet. Bishop and his sister Shard were born in one of these camps and branded with M tattoos above their eyes for identification. Later on, serving in the mutant police force called X. SE, Bishop traveled back in time while pursuing a criminal named Fitzroy. Joining the X-Men, Bishop reevaluated his upbringing and found support and a sense of family among the X-Men. At one point, however, Bishop betrayed the X-Men after the birth of Hope, the mutant messiah who was believed to have caused the persecution of mutants in Bishop's future. I mean, Bishop's past, which is the future for everyone else. <sighs> time travel, am I right? At number 2, Booster Gold. Booster Gold, also known as Michael Carter, is a time traveling superhero hailing from the 25th century. Armed with advanced technology, he fights crime with the help of his robotic sidekick Skeets. His closest ally is Blue Beetle, and together they form a dynamic duo. However, due to his carefree and somewhat self centered nature, Booster Gold is often not taken seriously by his peers, leading to frequent underestimation. In his origin story, Michael was a talented college football player who resorted to gambling on his own games to cover his mother's medical expenses. Despite his intention to quit after settling the bills, his father compelled him to continue the scam. Eventually, he was caught and banned from football. Forced to work as a night janitor, he eventually robbed the museum where he was employed, stealing all kinds of time travel tech, and then proceeded to escape into the 21st century, seeking fame and fortune as a superhero. And at number one is Spider-Man 2099. Working for Alchemex in 2099, Miguel became increasingly dissatisfied with the corporation's control over the city. Pressured by Tyler Stone, Miguel reluctantly tested a genetic coding process on a subject named Mr. Sims, resulting in Sims transforming into a grotesque creature and passing away. Fed up with Alchemex, Miguel attempted to quit, but was tricked into consuming a hallucinogenic substance called Rapture, which bonded to his DNA. This substance was manufactured solely by Alchemex, and Stone expected Miguel to remain dependent on it. And so, in order to break free from the addiction, Miguel decided decided to undergo the same genetic procedure that eliminated Sims, using his own original genetic code as a baseline. However, his supervisor, Aaron Delgado, sabotaged the process in an attempt to eliminate him. Despite the sabotage, Miguel survived the procedure with his DNA fused with spider genes, granting him various powers and freeing him from his rapture addiction. <laughs> 